And three, two, one. Oh, we're doing cold opens. Um, so we're supposed to just start talking. Right. About. Uh, we could talk about. We could talk about how much I hate our producer, Colin. No. No. Colin. <laughs> um, how he know. abandoned us to work our own camera. Dick. Yeah. What the fuck? All right, whatever. Uh, ooh, I didn't wear shoes today. It's pretty hard to come up with yeah. topics like right on the spot. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, that's probably our biggest challenge with this podcast. I mean, the camera, you just kind of, we don't have multiple camera angles. We don't like do the back and forth. So the editing is pretty simple. I just sync audio and uh, just generally we don't cultivate anything. We just, no. Yeah. Well, you, you're, you're a big stream of consciousness. I've been saying it for, Pretty much since we started doing this podcast, but your girlfriend Cameron said the same thing. I think we need to not speak to each other for like 24 hours beforehand. And even when we have interest, it's it's hard because we live together. But even when we have interesting thoughts throughout the whole week, excuse me, we should refrain from speaking. Also, since we I work together. very little friends that I want to conversate with. Also, we have Sundays where we work together for like right. eight hours. Yeah. And that's that just talking the whole time. everything. We should just do the <laughs> podcast at work. Yeah. Not really. If only. Not really. That would be cool. But then we'd have to invite other members of my workplace in to filter the discussions and such. And Yeah. I like know, it where it's just. I like it where it's just us too. We don't need all too. that. Um, all right, here's here's a question for you, Carl. Who, because we're going to start having guests in the podcast. Yeah. Who would be, I might turn myself up a little bit. Who would be your all-time, like, you can get anybody you want. Like, tomorrow, you just get the the contact book the uh, yeah, from the gods. We, we got it. Um, shit. I don't know, man. Because... Do you remember the episode we did with um, with Dan? Um, and it just turned into like us kind of like little brothering him and asking him a bunch of questions like about yeah. touring and shit like that. And yeah. Dan Kusa, right? Yeah. That's what you're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was a... It was fun. For us. For us. Yeah, for sure. It wasn't like a good interview in the slightest, Hang but we on. were just like happening with my going... Microphone. What? You're fine. It's recording. Oh, I was looking at your thing. I was talking. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Fuck me. This is what happens if we don't have a producer. Fuck you, Colin. <laughs> Idiot. Idiot loser. Um, okay. So I think it would be difficult for me to refrain from like fanboying anybody a hard, like a, an insane amount for at least like the first 10 minutes. Was, or like blatantly trying to not. Like, where it's like, okay, he's obviously just trying to, like, be too serious because yeah. blah, blah, blah. So, but without all that, um, who would be fun? Do you do you want me to say mine first while you think? Yeah. I think... No, I didn't even think about this. <laughs> um, I think it wouldn't... I think it probably would be, like, a comedian or somebody that would be, like, hilarious to talk to. Or, like, somebody, if it was, like, a musician or something like that, it would be somebody who, like, I'm a fan of because they seem, like, a likable and hilarious person. I'd pick Dave Grohl. Yeah, that'd be a fun one. Dave Grohl, because I don't think Dave Grohl's done, like, Joe Rogan or anything like that. And I feel like Dave Grohl would be a great person to listen to talk for, like, two hours. Because, he, he you know... He also just seems, like, nice and... I think he's. I think people call him like the nicest man and like nicest guy in rock and roll or some shit like that. I think that's his like shtick that he is really that fucking nice. nice. <laughs> and you've uh, you, yeah, but then you've seen that clip where he's talking to the people about. He's like, oh, listen, I'm gonna say it one more time. I stopped signing shit unless it's for charity, and they're like, oh, come on, Dave. Like, please. Have you seen this clip? Yeah, yeah. I think so he's like, see ya. And he just kind of runs back to his thing. Mm -hmm. uh, fucking hilarious. But I haven't seen him do any long form interviews and i think he'd probably have a lot of really cool stories i would assume that it's his choice not to do uh like joe rogan or something like that 
because you know he I, is Dave Grohl, yeah. so he can kind of he's he could probably do whatever the fuck he wanted. I mean, Billy Corgan did Joe Rogan, mm-hmm. which you know, mm-hmm. if the persona, you know, the personification, uh, the the live action version of Groot, not not Groot. What's, who's the who's the Minions guy? Gru. Gru. That's who Billy Corgan is to me. <laughs> he does look a lot like him. Um, but yeah, so Dave Grohl, I think, would probably be mine. And then what's yours? Yeah, like I'm, I, every th- idea that shoots through my head is like all these comedians that already have like their own podcasts. And I just want to have a podcast as funny as them. Like, I'm not going to say like Stavros because like, he's been podcasting and is on like a million podcasts all the yeah. fucking time. But like, I just want to listen to that guy tell stories all the time. And that shit is so funny. Like if only I if really, only. I, I mean, I hope people realize how fu- like truly it is. It is one of the most difficult things that I think we do is to go, Hey, three, two, one, be interesting. I, because it doesn't work. We're not interesting. Well, we're yeah. Just, I mean, we're definitely not as funny as the rest of the podcast people. I certainly you know so what I, you know what else? Uh, just a quick side note. I think that has made it more difficult this time around trying to restart it is like mostly because we live together now. Yeah, makes it so much harder. Because yeah. the when we the one time we got into such a groove was like the summer of 2018, where like we lived close by but not together. We didn't see each other every day. We both had things that were occupying our time and then we just set out time to like get together and do it and like that was like the only convert like same thing that we're saying to do more intentionally now in kind of like a funny way where we just don't speak for a day but you know that was like the easiest most natural and enjoyable maybe we just need to get drunk maybe that's what it is maybe we just need to it is 10 a.m yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. It's five o'clock somewhere in the middle of an ocean. Yeah. Do you think the creative process? Ooh, here's a great podcast topic. The Sick. creative process. So, in its purest form, creativity should just be relatively spontaneous, and it's natural, and it just happens. Mm-hmm. But, and you just do it when you feel creative. And if you don't feel creative, you don't do it, and it doesn't matter. Yeah. But as time goes on and you dive deeper into a creative uh, career, creativity has to be something that you can uh, turn on. Do you think, so what do you do, if anything, to kind of capture creativity into a box and like reach into it when you need to? Do you do anything and do you think that there's something that maybe you should be doing there's definitely there. something that like I could do better because I'm not great at that. Um, I'm definitely somebody that like for a long time felt that I needed to wait for the perfect day or perfect moment to get work done as far as creative work goes. And but something that one of my professors uh, taught early on while I was still in school was that it's important to just get yourself in position. And if the juices aren't flowing, then like you just got to do the other shit that you've been putting off logistically. Like he said, just spend like a two hour session just doing like sound design and like, or just build a sample pack because it's easy. It's mindless, but you can just like, focus on a simpler task than trying to arrange a whole song or finish lyrics or whatever. If you're not feeling that, you just organize the your files in your sample library or create a bunch of sounds and do sound design and just have a bunch of stuff because then you're adding to your tools that you can use later that can inspire creativity or while you're doing that, that can kind of like flip the switch and turn it on for yourself and then you can start getting into the other stuff if that work is what gets you to feel inspired, which is kind of what I'm trying to force myself to do now where I just know that I have time. I set it aside to go in and do it. If I feel like shit, I'll just go and sit down and start EQing 
vocals on an old song and just do that. And then eventually whatever made me feel like shit that day will leave my brain because I'll just get engrossed in that process. And then, yeah, maybe it's not a six hour session of songwriting and hard production and just everything is like the gears are turning and everything's working perfectly, but at least you have something to show for that time. And then that, that will make you feel better, and then future sessions will just become better and better from that. Yeah, but you know that feeling? It's like a momentum thing. Definitely. And even if you're not getting everything done that you set out for yourself, just sitting down and doing something builds a little bit of momentum overall. For sure. So I think there's two... Well, first off, I agree. Like, just sitting down and being in the, the mindset. It's the... Um, fuck, what is that book... We both read it. I listened to it because I don't like to read. The War of Art. The War of Art. The art. No, no, it's the War of Art. The, yeah. The art. War. The Art of War is a is yeah. a different one. My it's bad. It's a play on that title. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> the War of Art by. <laughs> and <laughs> you gotta do a voiceover of like the actual author's <laughs> name. Um, <laughs> it's basically one of the main concepts of the book is uh, to become a professional. And he uses the word professional to um, kind of encompass just like a person who can take creativity and get creative whenever they need to. And one of the main points is sitting down and just doing it every day. Like the professional works on their craft every day. So if you want to be a songwriter, um, it's like, okay, sit down and write a song every day. Even if it's trash, you just have to do it every day. You got to get those at-bats. Now, it's interesting because you and I are wearing multiple hats as these uh, just one guy music people, right? Mm -hmm. You have to wear the songwriter hat, the producer hat, the instrumentalist hat, the now podcaster hat, and now you know you haven't you're not in the rele you're not in a release cycle yet but but like yeah. i'm also in like the content I, fuck, I hate that word but like the content creator hat you know but so yeah, yeah i mean we talk about like the definition of being an indie artist is more than just chorus guitars and cuffed jeans and shit like that it's yeah. it's people for people that take it seriously it, it's down to recognizing that you're doing so many jobs that were never intended for one person to do, which is why labels and marketing teams and shit like that existed. And being an indie artist is like, you're just, you're the creative and driving force behind all of that while you're trying your best to make ends meet. Yeah. I so think it's, a, it's, I think that's probably an obvious thing for a lot of people, but it's interesting to think about, it's How, like, obvious. the artist, the singer, the songwriter is also compiling, like, email lists and shit like that. I think it's obvious to people because when they think about it, like, oh, if you're an independent artist, like, it's just you. I think a lot of independent artists have a team. Like, they have, like, a manager and a social media manager and stuff like that, which I would love to get to a point where I have multiple people on my team. Uh, but when you're first starting out, it truly is just you. I think people recognize that that's what it is. It's like, yeah, they're independent. They're doing it all themselves. Um, but what I think people might not fully realize is how... Ugh, like, I guess I don't want to sound like a fucking douchebag, but like how how difficult my job is, right? Yeah. Because not in the sense of... Uh, like physical labor or anything like that. Or even, I mean, the hours are pretty annoying. Like the amount of time that you have to put in sucks. But this, the work that, uh, that, that we do is very rewarding. What I find to be the most difficult is making that switch from musician, putting together a live set to songwriter, and then producer. Like those, those switches are difficult to make, but it's all part of me, musician. Um, I have a very difficult time switching back and forth between making content and like videos and thinking about music videos and photo shoots and X, Y, and Z. Um, 
and then going to like writing music. So back to your point of just sitting down and doing, and then, I have a hard time sitting down and doing because the things that, like you said, like, all right, just get done the, like the bullshit that it doesn't take creativity. So making a sample pack or like, you know, whatever, or like EQing vocals, that really nitty gritty stuff. For me, when I think, oh, I just have to sit down and do something, my brain goes to sit down and like edit that video. So in that sense, because I have to wear so many hats, it makes like the creative aspect of it suffer, I guess, because mm -hmm. I'm not sitting down as and then much. There's also the the networking side, which you have delved into a good bit with uh, like emailing people and trying to get on blogs and playlists and shit like that. It's fucking atrocious out there. We always talked about like pretending to be each other's managers for that, which probably could be useful because there's a legitimate, there's a like a uh, certain side of legitimization. Yeah, it's a word. Where like if somebody else is emailing on your behalf, it's like who's this guy? I like, think with yeah. a manager. I think you're right. <laughs> and, but first, it's just bullshit. At it first could be glance, fun. maybe. At first glance, I mean be like, oh shit, this person has a manager. They must be like not a complete whatever. But then they look at my Instagram and they're like, he has a thousand followers. And they're gonna be like, okay, well, never mind. And he's played at he plays at bowling alleys. You know, which was a fun fucking show, by the way. I liked playing at that bowling alley. Do you think you're going to, I mean, do you think you're going to miss playing like bullshit venues? Do you think artists who are at a substantial level um, are going to miss? Because I know, all right, so I like, have hold, a on, hold on, hold on. So I think, so like Nirvana, for example, they talked about a lot of the times when they started playing like stadiums how they missed playing clubs but when i think they're talking about clubs they're talking about like the tla that's kind which of is like a thousand I, was say. I think the the best quality that your music can get to is like right before you start playing stadiums because you're in a room that's like designed to do concerts and the there's a sound guy and there's a sound guy at all shows but stadiums weren't designed to be acoustically pleasing for a concert it's just a big cement dome and it's going to sound like shit at the end of the day unless it's painfully loud where you can kind of blow past the reverb all the time mm. that's in a stadium but there's no way that people in nosebleeds are like harry styles sounds really good from up here <laughs> like no it's bullshit yeah um and if you're too close, then the sound system is like all around you and it's chaotic when you're and really loud when you're up close. It's it's definitely difficult at that stage. And that's from a nerdy perspective where my one of my biggest dreams is to hear my music on like an insanely nice sound system. I have like this vision of something like Desert Days or Coachella where it's like these huge, huge sound systems with the whole synth stuff and a desert and all that and it's just like ground shaking. Outdoors is one thing too. I think that probably sounds all right because the sound has somewhere to go and dissipate. But yeah, I mean, I think the 1500 cap room is such a sick like level to be on yeah, as an but, artist so yeah like nirvana like i said their right. whole their main thing was like oh we miss that's, playing clubs that's but something that i would think would do you be think, very real do you think that people miss playing like the piece of shit shows where they never no one knows them probably not like the kind of shows uh similar to when we played at like the trocadero it was like a pay-to-play situation. Fuck that. I will never miss that yeah. fucking bullshit. Um, but Fuck pay-to-play. That thing is... That's an atrocious... That's an atrocious business model that I find... I'm... I accept it's... I accept that it exists, and well, I understand I why it would exist, but... If for anybody who doesn't know, pay-to-play basically means that you have to... So if I want to play a show... They make me buy 30 tickets of my own money, and then they're like, you sell that. That is different than, like, you have to pull this many people to play. Saying you have to pull this many people to play is whatever. But, like, 
making people buy the tickets up front is lazy on the booker's part. Now, um, we, for the we, sake we of actually getting didn't shows, have to do that, though. We just had to sell tickets by ourselves at $17 a pop when we were 19 Oh, yeah, we didn't old. have to pay. Never we mind. They were pay. sick. It was so cool. Awesome. Loved it. It was just expensive as fuck for kind of a random show with a random bill of people. Yeah. But, uh, you know, whatever. It was a cool experience. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know, man. I haven't done those shows, so I can't say for sure that I won't or will miss them. I'm just kind of... I think they're valuable. I think having, I think a lot of musicians will I think get. It's, it, yeah, it's probably the same as everything, bro. Nostalgia is nostalgia, you know. Even yeah. if you have like years of horrible experiences playing to six people at a bar, I'm sure that years down the road, when you're playing sold out shows, you probably will think back of them in a pleasant, in a pleasant way because you're you're reaping the fruits of that labor and. How can you look back on even negative experiences in a 100% negative way if they turned out to lead towards a good future? So, Well, hot damn, know. Carl. Why don't you write a philosophy book? Jesus Christ. What would you Maybe call, that's what we're doing here. What would you call your book? If you had to write like Carl's advice to people, like what would you write? Your, what would the title of your book be? Carl's advice to people? No, 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 no. <laughs> like... Like Carl's thoughts, or like tidbits from Carl, or <laughs> tidbits. Carl, from Carl bits. Carl bits. Bits of Carl. Carl bits. Bits of Carl by Carl. I don't know, bro. What would yours be? What would mine be? If I was gonna give an advice book, it would be the mm. one phrase that can sum up my outlook mm. on life. Nobody loves you. That nobody loves you. <laughs> That's a pretty solid place to, and we're pretty much. Oh yeah, what time is it? Time to time to leave. No, yeah, we got two minutes to spare. We can. It's gonna be a short one today. Fuck you. Bye.